Welcome to Spring at CMU. On behalf of students, staff, and faculty, we are thrilled that you've joined us for this unique virtual opportunity to connect. My name is Terry Schellenberg, and I serve CMU as Vice President External. We are all in the midst of a deeply strained and complex time. Mere weeks ago, phrases like COVID-19, social distancing, presumptive cases, flattening the curve, or closed borders would have seemed foreign. And yet, these now form part of our everyday speech. In these past weeks, Zoom and FaceTime have become essential tools to connect. Virtual congregational worship service is a norm, and supporting children to learn at home or seniors in their isolation confront many of us. Each of us is asking how to keep ourselves and our community safe, and we all share deep concern about how this present reality impacts the most vulnerable among us. There are so many, both at home and around the world, whose health and livelihoods have been put into fragile places because of this pandemic. In short, any normal patterns, from shopping for groceries to being together with family and friends, have been jarred. And we wonder who we are together in this time and how this experience will reshape our collective future. Over the past month, COVID-19 has certainly also confronted CMU. We have moved through a complex process to ensure the safe return of 43 out-of-town students and leaders safely home from Guatemala. We've moved classes from in-person to online, dramatically shifted on-campus living spaces, and cancelled, postponed, or as with Spring at CMU, reimagined virtually many university events. We've chosen this video format this evening because you, CMU's alumni, friends, and donors, care about what's happening here and how it is that this unique learning community is responding in the midst of a great challenge. So, in the coming 45 minutes, we invite you into the experience of staff, students, and faculty as they reflect on the challenge and the resilient hope they claim in the present moment. We highlight a significant academic program, communications and media, through the voices of recent graduates and a present student. And we invite you to walk alongside and support this Christian university a learning community with an ongoing commitment to nurture qualities of character, of calling, and of faith, so necessary in this time. So welcome to Spring at CMU. Following an opening song by the CMU Singers, under the direction of Dr. Janet Brenneman, Charlie Peranto, CMU's residence director, will reflect on the experience of what had been nearly 200 students living on campus. Charlie's comments will be followed by those of Inda Paroli, a fourth-year student who will graduate this month which a with a Bachelor of Science and a double minor in Biblical and Theological Studies and Communications and Media. Inda is an international student from Albania who has very capably served as the CMU Student Council President this academic year. So let's open our program with the CMU singers as they sing not one sparrow is forgotten, the text of which is drawn from Matthew 6 and 10, reassuring us that in the midst of all that life can bring, God's care and presence abide. Not one
Hi, my name is Charlie Peranto, and I work in the Student Life Department here at CMU. With the unprecedented changes we've seen over these past few weeks, one commitment hasn't changed, and that's the desire from our staff and faculty to partner with students in their learning and in their lives. For the Student Life Department, this means that we continually reach out to our students and meet them where they are. Most recently, that has been in virtual spaces, and this has required creativity and commitment. We, including our CMU counselors, continue to talk to students regularly by phone, email, and online through Zoom in order to provide care and support. These connecting opportunities are vital to them, even though social distancing means that we meet far less often in person. Let me give a few examples of how things have changed over these last few weeks. Worship has continued virtually, with chapels held every Tuesday and Friday, and we come together with students from across the country to worship together, no matter where they are. Our athletics department is offering online fitness classes twice a week, and just this week, the athletics banquet was held virtually, and we are able to give our student athletes the recogni recognition that they deserve for their fantastic achievements this year. We have also noticed that our international students uh, are gathering in these virtual spaces. Their Thursday lunch gatherings remain an important connection space for them, even doing it online. During these times, international students share the impact of COVID-19 on their families, their home countries, and on their personal lives. We find it so encouraging to see our students still reaching out for connection. You should know that two weeks ago, we closed our dormitory and asked that all of our domestic students uh, to return back home so that we could provide safe housing for, and social distancing for those who couldn't return home. This, uh, this overwhelming uh, response, the overwhelming response from our students was one of gratitude for CMU prioritizing their safety. They knew that even though we are not able to gather together in person, the community that we built would be able to endure these changes. As of today, we continue to support the nearly 100 students and families who do continue to live on our campus in apartments. So in short, in spite of the many changes, faculty and staff continue to walk alongside our on-campus students, our commuter students, student athletes, and our international students. It's just part of the mission of CMU, and I feel privileged to be able to do so. Hello, everyone. My name is Inda Pirodi. I am an international student from Albania, hoping to soon graduate with a three-year bachelor degree in general sciences. When I was first asked to speak of my experience at CMU a month ago, I was prepared to talk about the idea of being comfortable with being uncomfortable. An idea I initially borrowed from Luvi Ajawi, a fearless Nigerian woman who finds comfort in the ability, and I quote, to critique the world and the people who refuse to do better. With this idea, I was hoping to tell the short story of how being the student council president this past year has taught me to find comfort in the most challenging times, be it the process of learning how to adapt in a new culture or the struggle of choosing which part to keep for my own. I wanted to believe that true discomfort began with yelling for justice and standing up for those in need, that to be a hero is to do something about it. But today, standing here in front of a camera, alone, two meters away from Daryl Newsetter Bark, one of my instructors as well as CMU's media production coordinator, I realize that this confinement is too small of a box for discomfort to be in, and that heroes look a lot like Daryl, present and yet far away, as I and every single person in this world are being asked to redesign and reimagine our lives during this rise of the pandemic, I find that the best kind of discomfort we need to pursue is the aspiration for hope, the aspiration for a new kind of normal. As my professor, Tim Rogalski, always writes, in this, together, stay well. Hello, my name is Cheryl Pauls and I serve as president of Canadian Mennonite University. Come along with me into a biblical story through a gem that's nestled between grand confessional statements of Hebrews 11 and 12. 
The story goes like this. Miriam, the sister of a baby named Moses, was touched by his beauty and chose not to be afraid and went and hid him in the bulrushes. That is, she saw that he was beautiful and chose not to be afraid of the king's edict, so followed through on a rather unusual path. She watched, an urgency of heart in her throat, yet waiting patiently. She had no idea or control of what we know happened next. An Egyptian princess came by and found the basket in the bulrushes. And the princess was touched by the baby's beauty, chose not to be afraid of what her father might think, and provided a safe space for the child to grow up as her adopted son. Many years later, Moses himself was touched by the beauty of an oppressed people, chose not to be afraid of losing personal security and success, and followed the path that emerged before him to stand up for the welfare of this group. My prayer is that everyone who connects through CMU in this time and always would be touched by whatever is beautiful, choose not to be afraid, and follow paths that emerge with grace and raw courage. Over the next few minutes, I'm going to chat with some students. The beauty of who they are touches me and helps me choose not to be afraid in trusting that God's goodness goes on. First, I'll meet with two students by shouting up at a window from a front lawn. You'll get why. And then I'll meet five more students over Zoom. For some context on the first ones, a few days ago, CMU's out-of-town group of 43 came home from Guatemala, thanks to a grand effort of the Canadian government. Now, they're all self-isolating for 14 days, although some are in groups of two. So here goes. Good evening. Here we are at 206 Home Street, and up there on the third floor is Miriam Hubner and Carol LeBlanc, and they're on day four of self-isolating, and they're re reserved only to the third floor in that house for 14 days. So after their um, dramatic return from Guatemala four days ago, can you give us some tips on what it is to self-isolate? Um, I think our number one tip is to make a schedule the night before so you don't have to think of uh, what to do on the spot the next day. It's also, we found it good to do yoga because then we can still get some exercise even though we're not allowed to go outside. Hey, that sounds great. So tell us something that you loved about Guatemala and especially something that you wish would happen here in Canada more. Uh, I really liked the public transit and it was really easy to use and a lot of people also would walk in Guatemala and I think that's a lot nicer than using cars and I wish we could do it here but it's kind of hard with our weather. It's also, I really liked um, the sense of community I felt in where we were living. Um, like my host family and lots of other host families, like it's very multi-generational housing. Like the grandparents and parents and like kids, like they all have houses on the same property. And then also lots of friends come over all the time for meals and like just to help each other out. So I wish it was more like that here in Canada. Hey, that sounds great. So you mentioned your host, host families and you lived with these host families. So tell, tell us something you appreciated about those families. I really liked how patient my host family was. Uh, I think that they expected me to know more Spanish at first, but they quickly like realized that I didn't and they really helped me to learn and they spent time talking with me and it was really nice. It was also really nice to get more of an inside like perspective on the culture. Um, like, cause my host family, there was a few times where they taught me how to cook different traditional Guatemalan food, like tortillas or other just like cool things that now I know how to cook. So it was cool to like see more of um, <laughs> like what? That sounds great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so hey, you know, you see, you get a little giddy when you're in a small space for four days. <laughs> and I get that. Anyway, can you say goodbye, good night, whatever to us in Spanish? Adios, <laughs> buenas noches. Hey, thanks so much. Good luck with ten more days. <laughs> Thank Thanks. you. Bye bye. So here we are back in the hall with our new form of engaging with students. And so I'd like to introduce you to Odilio Duffus and Matthew Parkinson, Hannah Drudge, Daniel Lysak, and Nadia Langwatz. Say hi, everyone, and, and good to have them with us here today. 
Now, here you are all cooped up at home, except I see Matt there that has, he's somehow on the beach, but it looks kind of like a strange beach. So you might want to wonder whether he's actually there. In any case, uh, here you are cooped up home, trying to write all these papers, and you have, in a certain sense, way too few distractions at the moment. Give us a sense of something of what your experience has been like as classes and actually most of your lives have moved into a virtual platform. We'll start with Hannah. Yeah, so as I've reflected on the past couple weeks, I've realized that while it's been hard to make this transition, there's been a lot of really wonderful moments as well. And I hesitate to say this because I know there's so many people who are hurting right now, but I've decided that I don't need to let society write the story of my experience. So the world's telling me to be afraid, but I've chosen to not let fear become my story of this time. So instead of focusing on how I can't interact in person with professors and fellow students right now, I'm grateful for the way that the CMU community continues to show how much it cares about one another. I think that there's something powerful about in the face of uncertainty and crisis and loss, choosing to continue to live without fear. Uh, because my fear will not heal any of the hurt in the world, but I think that refusing to give into it is a pretty good place to start. Hey, thanks, Hannah. Let's go over to Adelia. Hello <laughs> again. Um, actually, it has it really started out rough for me because I was planning to go back home to Jamaica uh, when the semester ended. So at first, I was actually devastated I spent quite some time crying <laughs> and I'm not afraid to admit that I was actually very sad and I became very fearful but then in the midst of all that's happening I remembered God and I remembered that God is always with us and he's there for us and everything happens for a reason so I actually took this time and what I'm taking this time currently to commune with God more. I, I have more time to talk to him. And I really appreciate the little things now, like taking walks in the forest. Before I was never a nature girl, but now, trust me, <laughs> hashtag nature girl. Um, and I appreciate the small phone calls from family members and friends back home and even friends here. Like I have a friend that lives down the hall and when she calls, it, I get so excited because we can't really meet but the phone calls and the video calls, they make a difference. And I really feel much closer to the faculty now more than ever. Um, they're like parents to me now, or aunts and uncles, because they not only update you on assignments or final exams, but they, are you okay? How are you handling, how are you handling it? How's your family back home? So I really appreciate stuff like that. Even the cafeteria staff, every time I go in, they compliment me on something or ask if I'm doing okay. And it really makes me feel at home, even though I'm not home. So I've been like my perspective and my attitude towards this whole thing took a turn around now that I have the time to appreciate the things I didn't appreciate before. Hey, thanks so much, Odelia. And just so everyone knows, the only students that are left in the dormitories and accessing the kitchen are those students who came from international places and are unable to go home. So let's go on now to Matthew. What's going on for you? Yeah, it's been really interesting just kind of adjusting to the whole online class format and all that. I definitely find that rather than being sad about not having school anymore at CMU itself. It's definitely nice. Now I can get up 15 minutes before class and just turn on my computer and I am in class. And I can also be on the beach if I want to, which is something enjoyable about the experience. And just also, despite being isolated in our own homes and everything, it's been nice getting in touch with old friends over video chats as well and like just doing small little things together just eating breakfast in the morning together on a video which is something you would definitely love to do in person but it's also something just special doing it with friends online in that sense so hey thanks so much matt let's go on to nadia 
I think during this transition, one of the biggest things I've become more attuned to is the kind of touch that extends beyond physical touch, because obviously that's been restricted. Um, and maybe more precisely, the ways I felt physically touched without actually being touched. And this happens every day when I walk across the street to Vimy Ridge Park and I sit on the same picnic table and I just allow the sunlight to touch me. And I can feel it, the sun, the heat, the birth of spring. And I think we're all feeling it. It's why at eight in the morning when I go for a run, almost the whole city is outside. <laughs> Thanks so much. And uh, Daniel. Yeah, so this transition to online classes has certainly been different. And it's, it's, no, um, it's no secret that there's some part of the classroom atmosphere that we're certainly losing in that switch. But I think that a transition away from a physical classroom has also opened up some other opportunities that otherwise would have remained closed. And so one of my seminar style classes, while our class discussion has moved entirely to a online forum format, where we type our responses to the readings we've done for the past week, we now spend some of that class time where we would have been in class just talking about things outside of school, talking about how the family dynamics have changed now that everyone's coming home. For some of the people in the class, they have children talking about how what it's like having to do schoolwork with the children at home all the time. Talking to the professors about how their lives are going and how this has been difficult for them. And that's something that you wouldn't do in a standard classroom. It's something that in a standard classroom, you're there to talk about school. But I think that this, although definitely a tragedy, has been an opportunity to connect on different levels that perhaps we wouldn't have not gotten to otherwise. Hey, thanks. So to draw the last two together, a personal touch that is actually happening in more ways through this virtual context. I want everyone to also note that every single person has learned their etiquette of putting on mute when you're not speaking and then just turning on your sound when you are speaking. That's an important skill if you're gonna move into a Zoom context for those of you who aren't there yet. So let's go on to another question here. At some point, we trust that the pandemic will end. In the days and years that follow, renewed ways of thinking and doing will be critical to the shape of life and to the quality of livelihood for everyone. So the question is, where do you see yourself in terms of the people you might bring together over the next months and years to think about the well-being of society as a whole? What kind of hope do you see as a way forward into a restored reality? So let's begin with Matthew on this one. Um, something I've been thinking of in kind of the weeks and the years to come is just looking at how our globally the entire world kind of came together around this issue and how we've all kind of worked together to prevent the spread of the virus any farther and just trying to work together in a global community, which is awesome. And for the future, for myself, I would love to bring together and build that global community farther. And right now, working with some people in Australia, I hope to bring together some youth either from Australia as well as Canada in the future and go do a missions trip somewhere. So that's where my energies are focused. This summer is just kind of wait and see, but hopefully by next year will be something kind of tangible going into the summer of 2021, so. Hey, thank you. And how about for you, Adelia? Oh, well, for me, I'm kind of focused on a more spiritual or a mental uh, holistic well-being. Um, during a time like this, uh, everybody needs a savior. Everybody's looking for someone to turn to when everything else seems uh, dismal or everything seems like it's all going wrong. And I feel like CMU could be the center of that. Um, I realize that globally, all countries are coming together to pray. Um, we're all coming together to support each other. And I feel like that's something we should carry on even after the virus is contained. Um, the fact that we're supporting and we're building unity through this whole pandemic, it's really 
um, touching, honestly, because I don't feel alone. And I'm sure many other people don't feel alone, too, because all countries, I uh, especially here, I feel like we're all doing something to ensure that those who are without and even those who have um, are maintained or they're happy in some sense. Um, also, I appreciate the way that we are treating the environment at the moment. And I feel like um, on a journey to a restored reality, that could be something that we keep up. Um, respecting each other's space, practicing proper hygiene. Those are things that I feel like will, you know, help restore reality in a more positive way than we, are, we have been doing in the past. Hmm. Thank you. And Nadia. I think my greatest hope is that we become more attentive or remain attentive to space. And this attentiveness will probably look different for all of us, but I, I, I hope we don't lose the possibility of it. And across all of our differences, I think one of the important questions is where has God entered into this space with us and how? And when we arise from this sort of wilderness, I hope we have a collective understanding of the grace that's inherent to empty space, um, the gift of being lost, if only to be found again. So I guess my hope would be that we are found by each other and by God. Hey, thanks to all five of you. These have been really beautiful responses. And so this whole sense of because something is beautiful, we choose not to be afraid. And Hannah beginning with uh, not being fearful. Um, these were beautiful messages. And so you've nourished my sense of how not to be afraid. And I trust you have been for our audience today as well. So blessings to all of you. Thanks for taking this time. All the best as you go back to all that writing in those small spaces, including Matt's beach small space. And um, look forward to being together in live spaces again sometime before too many months. Take care. God bless. Over the past few weeks, faculty and staff have worked around the clock to put their courses online. And today, I'm joined by Wendy Craker, Assistant Professor of PACTS, Peace and Conflict Transformation Studies, and Paul Dick, Professor of English, uh, who are gonna talk a little bit about the experience of teaching and learning during this time. So I, I'm wondering if you both could tell me a little bit about how you brought your courses online and how you brought students into that learning environment. I'll start, John. Um, a way that uh, I got going on it was to use Zoom, which is a platform I already was familiar with, so I could just get going on it. So it was a normal for me. And then I tried to think, how can I structure still so that the class feels normal with the kind of things we do? We talk in groups. Uh, I make presentations. They make presentations. But yet, although we said normal, people would lean in close to the screen and really say what was on their hearts. And so we had a mixture of normal and a kind of new intimacy and urgency in the class. Paul? Uh, I set up a Moodle site uh, where we can together post questions and project ideas and respond to each other's ideas. Um, and I'm also using, like Wendy, I'm using Zoom uh, where I can teach in real time and we can all see each other and uh, talk face to face. Like we're doing here. Um, so I'm wondering if you can also tell me one story, just one story of a meaningful interaction you had with your students over this last several weeks. Okay, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'll say my first one is we did class presentations this week. And what I instructed them to do when I unmuted them was after a person presents, just whoop and holler and clap as loudly as you can. And after the first person received that, you could just see the smile on their face of, they liked me or they, they listened to me. And people made great efforts to show up at class. One student was in a small village uh, outside of their town library, catching the internet feed. Uh, in his car saying, hey, Wendy, I'm my class. Wow. I actually had a student uh, coming in from uh, ice fishing, uh, <laughs> like actually zooming while ice fishing. 
Um, you know, I'm teaching a Renaissance literature course, and it's been amazing to see how every writer we look at is somehow uh, made more vivid by the current situation. We're looking at, like, as in our class, we're looking across the gap at each other in our homes, in our dorm rooms, and reading John Donne about how no man is an island, or Catherine Phillips on friendship across distance. Everything just seems to matter more now. Wendy, Paul, thanks so much for telling me these stories. It's really good to have a window on what CMU faculty and students are doing to learn together in this time. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Hi, my name is David Bolser. I'm Assistant Professor of Communications and Media here at CMU. The Communications and Media program exists because the world needs good storytellers. It's good when people think carefully about how we craft messages. It's good when people recognize that shared meaning lies in people, not technology. It's good when people believe that the creativity of sounds, words, and images are a gift from God to be shaped for the sake of others. We help students enhance their communication skills, expand their ability to evaluate and produce stories, and to engage in experiential learning with industry leaders. Communications here is a team effort. As an interdisciplinary major, students interact with English, sociology, psychology, business, theology, philosophy, and the list goes on. This creates the vital capacity to think across worlds of meaning. Nurturing good storytellers is what we do. I like to think of what's become of the Com Media program as a good news story. This evening, we pause to honor the vision and longstanding support of Hilda and Elmer Hildebrandt in relation to this program. In the early days of CMU's founding as a university, Elmer was persistent in casting a vision for a communications component. That persistence was coupled with an open-hearted financial generosity to see the vision come to life. I heard the vision put to me this way. Can we put faith-informed students into Canada's newsrooms? And throughout the past decade, that vision has taken shape and taken root. I found it incredibly inspiring when Elmer has said to me, the legacy of our support will only be fully known after we're gone. Thank you, Elmer and Hilda. May God honor your vision today and tomorrow. Coming up next are two videos. The first is entitled, Communications and Media Graduates Out There. In mid-February, CMU's videographer, Daryl Neustadter Barg, and I hit the road across Manitoba. We wanted to catch glimpses of communications and media grads out there in their places of work and service. These are just a taste of what has taken root and flourished. And then immediately following the stories of graduates out there, you'll meet Chloe Friesen, a third year communications and media major from Morden, Manitoba, who is still here. She reflects on her current experience as a student. And you need to know that Chloe wrote, captured, and produced her entire piece. So let's head out onto the road and meet some of those graduates. I, I mean, I love environments that are full of energy. I love being in places like the Briar, like this place, when it's a packed gym where there's just a buzz and a lot of excitement around it. So to be a part of helping create those moments through what I do with my with photos, with the stories that I write to help people follow along and add to it, I think is just surreal. <laughs> my job now sometimes is you have two 1500 word pieces, it's three o'clock, they're due at nine. And oh, and you have to go out and shoot their practice and interview all of them tonight. Uh, in the end, you have 45 minutes to write a thousand words, have fun. If anybody wants to make it in communications and media or anything, I think the number one lesson, the number one discipline is to refuse to ask for any extensions ever and just to put it on yourself that this is my job. I personally love the deadline rush. This is our archives. This is right back to the 1800s. This is the Brandon Sun in this room. 
Uh, this is what we do. Journalism is a, it's a calling. It's not just a job. You have to be willing to put in the extra hours. It's always on your mind. You know, you never get away from it completely. So that's something we saw with Thomas right away was, you know, his interest in the job and the fact that he embraced the role and realized pretty quickly that this wasn't just another nine to five job. This is something you have to be invested in. Brooklyn Taves hanging out with you here uh, almost halfway through our two o'clock hour. Walking into the studio for the first time at CMU um, was such a cool experience because that's where things feel tangible, right? You have all this physical equipment around you and surrounding you, and I get to do that here. Connecting communities, that's what Golden West does, and CMU taught me a lot um, about appreciating the communities you're in and the variety of people you have there. We have a very multicultural area in the Pemna Valley. So I learned a lot about how to treat and work with that as I was learning media at CMU. As a Christian, at a Christian university mostly, but you meet a lot of people from a lot of religions. You learn to have a lot of respect for people. You learn to listen twice as much. So no matter where people are coming from, I'm just like, yeah, come, you have a story to tell and I want to help you tell that story. Her personal skills, her, her video skills, her, her writing skills uh, and more have allowed Brooklyn to do what very few people in this building have been able to do, and, and that is most of the jobs that are available inside of this building. Uh, and I think her, her knowledge from CMU has helped with that. It's weird, but almost every single class I've taken in terms of practical communication at CMU has applied itself to ministry. The different kinds of media that we're engaged in allow for different avenues and possibilities of ministry that sometimes open doors that weren't there before. So in my own thinking, I was like, I'm going to go visit somebody and I'm going to ask them personal questions about faith. My purpose isn't, though, just to make a great video. My purpose is actually to, to it's almost like a pastoral visit while doing the video. You could hear the resonating uh, among people. So he's using this medium that, that enables people to ask the more difficult questions uh, in a way that you know that Moses is going to manage this safely. And so what he did is he just evoked these questions that you think, oh, wow, I didn't realize that person was thinking about this too. But they are. So I do a lot of creative writing. Um, I also have been working on some poster design, some graphic design. Um, I do a lot of photography for events. And then also, yeah, the other half is um, actually being the liaison for the event and talking to people. Yeah, making sure everything's under control. <laughs> I really like talking to donors uh, when donors will call in. So that is really interesting, seeing the, the different MCC projects around the world and seeing the impact that they have and the impact that they have on donors and hearing the donors how they feel once they feel that they're um, that they are making a difference. Yeah, that's really, really cool. <laughs> I'm just I'm very grateful for CMU um, for the four years that I spent there. I did the out of town program my first year, and that also really shaped my experience. It was very positive. I see as Emily Ann's strength um, and is a real asset to the department is that she comes with a, a confidence. Um, and and a, a willingness to to take a risk, but hand in hand with that, also um, the the humility really and the graciousness to to accept um, constructive uh, review of your work. Then in that context, and always be learning. While I was attending CMU before I got the practicum, I don't think it's something that I would have even dreamed of because it just seemed too far out there and um, something that seemed like it should have come further down the road. So I feel really honestly quite blessed. A frequent thought that comes up from my studies at CMU would be uh, the thought of uh, telling a compelling story. Um, that's something that came through in a lot of classes, whether it was the radio team classes where we're doing, uh, focusing heavily on a few interviews uh, each semester to, to tell a good story, um, or whether that was through uh, the qualitative inquiry class with uh, Rod Raynor. I mean, obviously that shows up uh, when I'm doing interviews for, uh, for articles, uh, asking, asking good questions that uh, will, will take you to a place Place that's going to get you a, the story that you want and uh, the story that's going to be compelling to your readers. What do you got to do to keep this momentum going uh, now that you're, you're in your stride? 
oh, you know, like like I said, keep things quick, keep things simple. Uh, you know, get uh, get our messages deep in the zone, cycled around, um, uh, and make sure we get uh, get some traffic through. Uh, you know, I think that uh, that's the key to our game, and we'll uh, we'll keep going with that. Appreciate this, Jason. Thanks for your time. Anytime, David. Back to you, Mark and Rob, upstairs in the True North management booth. What was kind of the defining moment was uh, Jason's writing ability. Right from the get-go, uh, his writing was clear, concise, uh, very little editing, and that's, um, and I mean no disrespect, but that's rare uh, to do with students right out of school. And frankly, he edits my stuff sometimes too and does a great job, so just goes to show uh, the, the strength of writing that has come from CMU. Uh, but in particular, not to take anything away from Jason, just he, he clearly has a talent and an understanding how to do this. Always been like the person that would rather not talk, just sit in the corner, do my work and just, you know, live my life kind of thing. But since being at CMU, it, kind of, it, it literally kind of forces you out of that shell because classes are so small. I manage all the social media accounts, so Facebook, Instagram. Twitter and LinkedIn. When I was told that I would be the voice of APTN, it's it's honestly like I'm excited to be a part of that, but also I'm scared because that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> but I've been here for about three months now and I love it. It's so cool. I get to talk to and learn about so many new things that I never knew. So she represents APTN, all of us in the company, uh, and speaks on our behalf. Um, so, you know, she's a we, not an I, and she uh, interacts with all these communities. When we speak to our audience, we speak as if we're speaking to our elders. Uh, we are respectful. We do have a certain voice that we use. It's our brand, and she grasped that immediately and was fantastic when I would see her responses and I was kind of looking at what was the conversations that were going on. I was not the least bit concerned. I was like, wow, she really understands us. Thank you, Elmer and Hilda. Uh, it's been a great experience learning at CMU and I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Thanks for all your, your hard work and your, your vision that you set out for CMU. It's uh, made a big impact on my life, obviously, so um, I hope it uh, continues to impact many lives to come. I'm now working towards my dream job at MCC and loving it. Thank you for, for casting this vision and making opportunities like the one I have now possible. Thank you, Elmer, for a tiny little radio station in Altona uh, that grew into my home in Winkler where I can work with some of the newest technology out there right at home. I don't think anyone could have expected how much the communications and media program would enrich and will enrich the church to come. Thank you for your investment. Hello, everyone. My name is Chloe Friesen and I'm in my third year of studies at CMU. And as you may have predicted, I am majoring in communications and media studies. The fact that we're celebrating this program, my area of study, brings me so much joy and fills me with endless amounts of gratitude for all of you listening. Let me tell you why. This event, Spring at CMU, is an event all about gifts. Gifts are given, gifts are received, Gifts are celebrated. One of my favorite parts about birthday parties as a kid was the knowledge that I'd get to write a thank you note to every single person who gave me a gift. Maybe I was a strange, strange little kid who really liked gel pens and stationery, or maybe I was born to be a communication student. I prefer to believe the latter. But either way, I knew the moment I was asked to speak today, I couldn't help but make my speech a verbal thank you note to the communications and media program and all who make it possible. Because the number of gifts I've received from the hands of this program is remarkable. So let me begin. Dear communications and media program, thank you for letting me use my hands as much as I use my head for placing cameras, microphones, brushes, and ink in my backpack, in addition to my books. For creating assignments that I cannot wait to complete, like designing posters, album covers, and magazine spreads. Or hosting radio shows, giving speeches, and debating with my classmates. For believing wholeheartedly in the beautiful truth that we learn by doing. And oftentimes the best lessons come hand in hand with some good old fashioned failure. Dear Communications and Media Program, 
Thank you for the abundance of opportunities that you provide your students. David Balzer, if you didn't know, is a walking bulletin board full of job postings. I cannot possibly count the amount of times David will begin a class with, so I've got this job opportunity you might want to consider. It was one of these very opportunities that got me my first job in the communications field. With our good friends at Golden West Radio as a Celebrate Summer host in my home of the Pemina Valley. It was through this opportunity that I completed my practicum by traveling the valley, attending event after event, dancing my way through small town parades, hearing and telling incredible stories, and gaining invaluable experience that I fell in love with radio. Thank you for what you've created, Elmer. Its impact transcends generations and will continue to do so well into the future. Dear communications and media program, thank you for the confidence that you have instilled within me. The Chloe I knew from three years ago filled to the brim with anxiety and uncertainty thanks you with all of her heart. These days, standing on a stage or behind a screen, speaking to crowds of beautiful people like yourselves, creating something, anything, and sending it into the world is what I live for. Dear communications and media program, thank you for allowing me to have a lightness of heart for teaching me that it's okay to respond to stress with silliness and creativity, that sometimes the easiest way to connect with someone is through laughter. Thank you for letting me check out audio equipment from the library and then use it to chase around geese on campus and then formally publish the video of me making a fool of myself to the entirety of CMU, that's students, staff, and faculty. I am so grateful that you have fostered and encouraged my ability to make others smile. And finally, dear communications and media program, thank you for the lifelong connections you have helped me make with those around me, for turning classmates into friends and professors into mentors, for making my campus and classes so very easy to miss. I've never felt more loved, accepted, and supported than I do in this season of my life. Thank you. Thank you for making this all possible. Cheryl Pauls here on air for a second time, and I start with a question. In this time of extreme adversity everywhere, why would CMU invite support for the university? I'll quote Mike Dirksen's response to that question. Mike has graduated from CMU twice with a BA and an MBA, and now is executive director at Generation Rising. He said, the reason they are your donors is because you're solving a big, gigantic problem in the world. If that problem persists and you're going to work at it in the next little while, you owe it to your donors to help fix that problem. That's the reason they are your donors in the first place. So this evening, we invite you to support CMU because our work of addressing big, gigantic problems in the world goes on. It's likely not our science lab that will invent a vaccine for COVID-19. But the problems of this time go far beyond the virus. They extend into the qualities of mind and heart that hold back a health of livelihood and purpose for all, that hold back the flourishing of the world God so loves. So here's the invitation. Join with us in nourishing hearts and minds and skills for flourishing as church community, meets university education, meets science, meets social entrepreneurship, meets peace and collaborative development, meets communications and media, meets mathematics, meets music, meets Bible and theology, meets the character of students and of surrounding communities. As your hearts, minds, and prayers join with us, we know the financial scene is wild. All individuals and institutions are facing vulnerable conditions, and for many, there's immediate hardship and pain. CMU is among the many places that will struggle significantly in 2020 and beyond. We ask for your support because we need your gifts to keep CMU going. And we ask for your support because CMU is called to inspire and equip women and men to be touched by what is beautiful to choose not to be afraid, and to follow through on paths that emerge in the wilderness. As for how to give, it might be easiest to use the secure giving form on the giving page of the CMU website. 
If you would like someone to talk with directly, please note the phone numbers for staff, which are also on that giving page. Or you could send a check in the mail. The address is also on that page. Thank you for your friendship, your care, and your interest in CMU. Your prayers and gifts are cherished. God be with you. And now, a CMU student, Valeria Alapova, will offer a prayer. Valeria comes from Zaporozhye, Ukraine, and is serving as an interim associate pastor at Bethel Mennonite Church. She will graduate this spring with majors in psychology and peace and conflict transformation studies, and also a minor in biblical and theological studies. Valeria, please. Creator of all, we are thankful for your amazing grace in this troubling time, for the technology that keeps us connected while practicing social distance. We are thankful for the ability to, to connect and to celebrate together, even while being apart. We pray for those who are on the front lines, struggling with the reality of COVID-19, patients in hospitals or in isolation, and the doctors and nurses whose care they need. In this season of uncertainty, we ask to see your hope and grace. We long for your light. May it fill us so that we also might share it with others. Dear God, we are grateful for the strength, resilience, and guidance from CMU faculty and students. This semester has ended in the ways none of us anticipated. We pray for those whose plans have drastically changed. We are grateful for the vision of this university and the way it embodies head, heart, hands, and feet for learning and service. And we give thanks for many individuals and communities who entrust, envision, and support ways forward with CMU. Loving God, in the midst of these challenges, you come to us as a healing river and a rain of blessing. May our eyes continue to see and our hearts continue to know your comforting hand. God of grace, even in this time of uncertainty, hear this prayer of thanks. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for sharing Spring at CMU with us. Thank you for continuing to trust CMU with its mission. Thank you for your prayers and for your financial support. The students, the staff, and faculty of CMU are deeply grateful. We conclude our program with a song from the CMU singers. Hear My Cry connects deeply with our present moment. The text of this song comes from Psalm 102, a psalm imploring God's presence in a time of need. It reads, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress, but incline your ear to me and answer speedily in the day when I call. Please, choir. <laughs> 